Hello and welcome to an introduction to microscale techniques for teaching chemistry or as one person said in one of my workshops in a little you can see a lot. I'm Bob Worley, I work for Kleeps in the UK and you can contact me at the email address below where and also there is a website, a Twitter feed and some YouTube videos as well as the Kleeps YouTube videos. Although I had been interested in small-scale experiments when teaching in the 80s, I think it was this experiment that really uh, brought it home to me. Hydrogen was passed through uh, concentrated sulfuric acid to dry it and then over copper oxides to reduce the copper. The hydrogen was burnt at the end to avoid the copper reoxidizing on cooling. The problem was that if you lit the hydrogen too early, it could explode in the apparatus. In one such incident, the sulfuric acid went all over the children at the front, and this was investigated by the Health and Safety Executive. In the ensuing prosecution, the teacher was fined £500, and this was the first prosecution of a teacher in science by the Health and Safety Executive. I had been told then not to perform this experiment, it was banned, but when I got to Kleeps, I found it was not. It required a detailed risk assessment. In educational terms, this is a very important experiment, and I felt it was a shame to be banned. I then found inspiration from the Bruce Matson website on microscale gas chemistry, and I adapted the experiment to this. Bruce worked with syringes. And in this experiment, we filled a syringe, a 60 ml plastic syringe, with hydrogen and connected it to a Pasteur pipette. These are made of soda glass, so you can only heat with a spirit burner, one of my jam jar spirit burners. Heat the copper oxide up. You can then remove the flame and pass the hydrogen over the copper oxide for the first time. I saw that this was an exothermic reaction. Here's another view. Now, of course, we have copper oxide plus hydrogen, and that gives us copper, which you can see, and we should see water at the end of the pipette. And there it is. There was no chance of an explosion with this method, but I also found another method from South Africa. We adapted this method so that the apparatus was recognised by teachers in the UK. Here the copper oxide is heated, the hydrogen is generated in the vial, passed through a drying agent, calcium chloride, in that uh, silicon tube, and then heated, and there you could see the formation of the copper, uh, not exothermic directly because the passage of hydrogen is slower. And there you see the water coming off as well. In both of these methods, I could now see that microscaling improved safety and allowed us to do experiments which were previously quite dangerous. I'm going to construct a whole series of impacts that I think microscale chemistry brings to practical chemistry. Here you see a picture of the RADMAS kit from South Africa, developed by Professor John Bradley. It was designed to take chemistry to schools in South Africa where there were no laboratories. You can see the reduction of copper oxide with hydrogen in the bottom left hand corner. UNESCO saw an opportunity to expand the amount of practical chemistry in other parts of the world and they also developed microscale physics and science and primary science as well. So now I can add to safety that it promotes practical science in developing countries. Microscale chemistry developed in the universities in the United States of America. They found they could uh, reduce the amount of waste and save an awful lot of money 
by going microscale. The techniques were rather novel. Filtering was down a pipette with a little bit of cotton wool at the bottom. Distillation used a new piece of equipment called a Hickman still. And then uh, separation of immiscible liquids was by using a pipette, and very efficient it is too. But these are skills not recognised in the UK A-level syllabus, so I thought it was best to leave it uh, as it was, and not to, ta to do too much in that sphere. So now we have a very important third impact, and that it addresses environmental and green issues. Some of the equipment in our schools is very expensive and if it breaks it is not easy to replace it as the budget might be quite low. This Hoffman voltmeter costs over £170. Problems can include the sticking taps and the electrodes coming off. So we developed a microscale Hoffman voltmeter. This uses two syringes um, and the electrodes are still platinum wire, which are through a Petri dish. The gases can be removed using the three-way taps at the top. The electrolyte is sodium sulfate solution, so that is quite safe, and much safer than the one molar sulfuric acid used in the traditional equipment. You can make, take the gases off, test them, and you can make little uh, rockets of them. Well, that wasn't very good. But if you put custard as the base of the rocket, then it fires really quite well. Yeah. As well as the Hoffman voltmeter, we have found commercial products which are really inexpensive, such as the balance, which costs less than £10. And then we found crucible alternatives, such as using the bottle tops. And the results are quite stunning. And to the surprise of many traditional teachers, they're very uh, accurate and give you far greater information than the traditional methods. The design for this colorimeter came from the Journal of Chemical Education, and we improved on it quite a bit. Uh, it is surprisingly accurate and useful to use. It costs less than £20 to set up, and is equivalent to what you might pay for £100. So I thought that these four bullet points were really important and I could continue uh, developing some microscale techniques. But I was surprised that some of the information coming into Kleeps said there was more to this. Teachers reported how easy it was to carry out these procedures, how quickly the students performed them, and that uh, they could investigate some of the misconceptions held by students. Um, one said that I was lowering the short-term working memory, which, which was a surprise to me, so I thought I'd look into this a bit further. This experiment is my introduction to the workshop that I do. Making a universal indicator. The worksheet is inserted into a plastic polypropylene folder and you can add drops of these buffers to the plastic. The hydrophobic properties of the plastic keeps the, bub the puddle into a nice hemisphere. So adding buffers 1, 4, 7, 10 and 13. Now I apply the indicators Bromothymol blue, methyl orange, phenolphthalein. Then I make a mixture of these indicators and you get a universal indicator and compare it with the commercial version. This procedure really impresses technicians because they see the, they will not be washing up 25 test tubes per group doing this experiment. The students sit for the procedure, so classroom control is improved. The solutions are dispensed from the dropping bottles so that it is very easy to set up the experiment and very easy to uh, clear it away at the end. Disposal is just a wipe away with a paper towel so you have no big issues of clearing up 
chemicals. The results can be put into the uh, laboratory handbook by just photographing the result. And then people told me that what I was doing here was impacting and sh uh, on the short-term working memory of students so they could cope with the procedure. We're not just looking at one of those impact bullet points, but several of them at the same time. On a large scale, these experiments have produced quite an issue for some students who have been sent to hospital with breathing difficulties. But if we microscale it, then we get a, a different sort of scenario. Here I'm putting drops of potassium iodide and potassium bromide on the plastic base of a petri dish. I'm now moistening some blue litmus paper. We now add some copper chloride solution between the carbon fibre electrodes and now we run the electrolysis. Carbon fibre electrodes are really robust and do not break as pencil leads or graphite. The chlorine coming off and only 6 mil of chlorine gas is produced starts to affect the potassium iodide solution forming iodine. It bleaches the litmus paper and begins to then form bromine water in the potassium bromide solution. There is an awful lot of chemistry going on in this reaction. You can see the copper forming at the cathode on the left. Despite producing a toxic gas, there is no need for a fume cupboard. The only about six centimetre cube of gas is produced, and most of that is used up in the chemical reactions. It only takes about 10 minutes to perform, so the rest of the le lesson can be carried out by the teacher describing the chemistry going on and asking questions, normal teacher activities. So the safety and taking a load off the short-term working memory, and all sorts of reasons to do this experiment this way. This diagram shows the traditional way of carrying out catalytic cracking, where we break down long chains of hydrocarbon molecules to shorter, more useful chains. It is a real problem. It takes a whole lesson to set up. Um, despite using a Bunsen valve, you still get suck back of liquids, of a cold liquid, back into a hot boiling tube. And that can cause a, quite a catastrophic explosion uh, due to heat stress in the glass. This has caused injuries and we were threatened with uh, banning this experiment at one point by certain employers. In the microscale version, we use the a broken Pasteur pipette, which we sealed the end with heat, or one of those small ignition tubes. You do not need a Bunsen, it works quite satisfactorily with a jam jar spirit burner. You can pass the gases through 0.002M potassium manganate solution, which is decolorized, or through bromine water, which is decolorized as well. So the whole thing took 15 minutes to uh, set up and perform. There's no possibility of suck back and so uh, it's much much safer to do and enables the teacher time to teach in the rest of the lesson while the experiment is still fresh in the student's mind. Precipitation reactions are very common in schools. Usually students get two clear liquids, they mix them together and lo and behold a solid appears. We're going to look at this in a little bit more detail now. Here I am wetting the ends of two uh, wooden splints. I then dip them into the respective solids and then bring them back to the puddle. I put in some silver nitrate and some potassium iodide. See how little we use for this. The solids will now dissolve. That is something students never see. We usually give them two clear liquids. 
the solvated ions are now moving, and as they move towards the middle, so the precipitate forms. Bruce Matson saw this reaction and thought his first year university students could benefit by it. So he did it and was really impressed and we published this in Journal of Chemical Education in May 2019 and we were surprised and uh, honoured to see that we reached the front page as well. Here is a little model I made uh, using PowerPoint. The two solids will be outside the circle. The circle represents the puddle. The puddle contains water molecules, but putting all those molecules in will make it very confusing. The solids will dissolve and form solvated ions. The ions will then diffuse in the water. And as they come together, so the precipitate will form. All that remains are the spectator ions. Students' understanding of what spectator ions are is very, very weak indeed. Understanding this chemistry was brought up by Alex Johnston in the 1980s when he realised that it was very, very difficult for students to relate the macro events to the nano interpretations and to the symbolic equations, especially spectator ions. Understanding the small particles that we have to deal with in chemistry, invisible particles, is really difficult for many students. Atoms and molecules have been known for many, many years of their education. Even in their primary schools, they've come across the name. But ions is something different. And demonstrating the presence of ions by the conductivity of electricity through a molten salt is a really tricky experiment to do. You can see the reasons in the blue box. The microscale version, however, only requires 0.5 grams of lead bromide. It doesn't require a fume cupboard, so little um, bromine is formed. But you can see the bromine coming from the uh, positive electrode, which is made of nichrome wire. The negative electrode is an iron nail. And you only need to heat this with one of my jam jar spirit burners. It only takes a few minutes to perform and doesn't take a whole lesson as the traditional method does. I feel that these bullet points really help the teachers to teach the subject in far more detail and interesting detail as well. Using the Johnson's triangle, trying to get to grips with the what happens at the nano level and understanding the symbolic of equations and mathematics. This diagram shows the setup for the hydrogenation of an alkene. I usually use propene for this and make propane. I was really pleased that Declan Fleming took this up for the education in chemistry uh, with a superb uh, video and also an account of this in the, uh, art in the article. The liquid in the tube is 2-methylpropan-2-ol, tertiary butyl alcohol. And here you can see it freezing in an ice mixture. It freezes about 25 degrees, but then you can put it into hot water and you can see it boil. It boils about 85 degrees. So you can see all three states of matter from one substance quite easily. And you can reverse this process. Never did I think I would be able to liquefy chlorine with school equipment. And then I had managed to liquefy ammonia. I do this by using solid carbon dioxide in acetone, making the gases and then just passing the gas through uh, these small U-tubes. With liquid ammonia, you can then add a small piece of lithium and generate the beautiful blue colour of the solvated electron. Microscale chemistry techniques lend themselves to STEM initiatives. We've already seen the marvellous digital balances and the use of 
carbon fibre electrodes in place of graphite. Then there is the Ard connection with the Arduino uh, microelectronics, which is something we shall be exploring in the future. The LEGO colorimeter makes use of LEDs, both as a source of light and also the collection of the light after passing through the curvette. Then there are modern methods of construction such as 3D printing, laser cutting and even using Lego. And so we come to the complete list of my impact bullet points for microscale chemistry techniques. This begs the question, if it's so useful, why isn't everybody using these microscale techniques? Well, first of all, there's no intention to replace the uh, traditional techniques such as titration uh, with these new uh, ideas. But I always say that any microscale technique to be worthy has to add something more than what the traditional technique adds. You see those in the bullet point. In 1999, the Royal Society of Chemistry sent out this book to every school along with a Radmast chemistry kit. It raised a few eyebrows, I can say, and even at Cleeps we wondered how we could use this, this equipment. I always think that in some ways uh, this fueled the objections to many of the techniques that we have introduced uh, from Cleeps. I was surprised to find that the objections I had found uh, in the UK were exactly the same that John Bradley found when promoting Radmas techniques in developing countries. They're the first four bullet points. Until we get those people in examination bodies and uh, managerial positions to assess these techniques, then we're not really going to completely win them uh, everybody over. The comment about quantitative work is, is actually wrong. It can be extremely accurate and alarmingly so. Uh, when I do a titration by weighing, the results are very similar uh, to those with the volumetric equipment that we use. The final point is very important. We must back all this up with lots of training and CPD. And at the moment, uh, the money is not there, either here in the UK or in other countries. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Steve Jones uh, for all his encouragement uh, in for me to develop these techniques. He and Matt Endine have shown these to countless teachers and technicians on their health and safety courses. And to the wonderful technician team of Jane, Mary and Emma, who always improve on my ideas. And to Kay and Magda for their encouragement, and to David with his integrated uh, instruction sheets, uh, which use these techniques really well. I've heard it's not spectacular enough. Well, here's a microscale thermic reaction with the mixture in pa filter paper in the tin and you light it and there's the reaction and you're left with a, a little ball of iron. Well, that is the end, but I think I've enjoyed the frustrations of video editing and commentary. Uh, so there may be more uh, dealing with some more uh, intricate aspects of the subject. Uh, so I leave you with all the bullet points. Here we are.